Hello everyone and welcome to our new live webcast, Dominating Industry 4.0 with Secure Software Licensing. My name is Daniela Previtali, Global Marketing Director of Vibu Systems, and I am delighted to have you here with us today. Each month, join us for new powerful messages, technical tips and success stories that will leave you inspired and ready to get your protection, licensing and security techniques another step closer to perfection. Today, we are joined by Günther Fischer, Senior Consultant Licensing and Protection from the headquarters of Vibu Systems, and John Battista, Head of Support for Vibu Systems USA. A host today have a memorable program waiting for you. They are going to be talking about the common ground between Cookmeter Runtime and Cookmeter Embedded, an overview of all the license models Cookmeter Embedded supports, an inventory of all supported CM dongles and third party secure elements, including TPM for CME licenses, EX Protector and AX Protector CME, the dedicated modules of Code Meter Protection Suite for Code Meter Embedded, and Code Meter Core API, a powerful tool for robust cryptographic operations. Some housekeeping we need to take care of before we start. For everyone who's joining us today, I want to remind you that we will be reserving some time at the end of the session for Q&A, and I'd like to invite you to submit any question you have in the live chat room. The session is being recorded, and a link to the replay will be posted directly to you in a couple of days. And don't forget, stay with us throughout this live session for your chance to win an Amazon coupon worth 50 euro. At the end of the webinar, a pop-up window with three simple quiz questions will show up. You can submit one choice for each multiple answer question. We will draw the winner from among those who reply correctly and notify them at the time of the replay announcement. Please also note that the winner is excluded from all subsequent prize draws of 2017. Without further ado, I'll pass things over to Gunter. The floor is yours. Thank you, Daniela, for the great introduction. Uh, I would also like to say welcome. Uh, John, Batista, and myself, Gunter Fischer, are going to walk you through the next hour through the different functionalities of CodeMeter Embedded. Um, I would like to ask John to give us an overview of the basics and uh, so we have all the same page. Uh, thanks, Gunter. All right, let's have some of the basics. So CodeMeter continues with an embedded with the integrate once, uh, deliver many uh, structure whereby uh, we can go with a common distribution approach. You can have one single program for a given platform and the capability of the program will change depending on what the license is on that platform. So we do not have to have special versions for the uh, different uh, platforms that we have. <clears throat> these are the licensing systems that are available and these licensing systems also remain persistent in the embedded world. Uh, <clears throat> licensing structure remains pretty much the same as I've seen. Uh, firm code, product code, each product code has its own product item options. Uh, still up to 2,000 product items per container, generally limited by the memory of the container. Presently, we have uh, still the legacy firm codes of the 1 million range associated with dongles. Uh, the 5 million range, of course, as many people would, might recall, is the code meter act firm code. And the new universal firm code system falls in the 6 million range. And these are a very interesting firm code structure in that this kind of license can be temporarily or permanently moved from one container to another, regardless of it's a, if it's a dongle or a software-based code meter act container. So let's, uh, I'm going to hand it back to you, Gunther, for some of the license models that are available. Okay, thanks. So uh, with this product right of options, as we just have been introduced to, you have the possibility to create a lot of different license models. So here's an overview of 
some of the models that we support in CodeMeter, which is also available in the embedded space. So the most prominent one is probably the single user license and then the floating network license. But as you can see, there are many, many more. And you can all use of them. You can use all of them by using the CodeMeter embedded driver in the same way as you might be used to in um, doing with the regular desktop version. So by this, I would like to give you an overview of the three different variants that we have for the CodeMeter implementations. So it starts with the CodeMeter runtime, which is the full-blown implementation that already exists since many, many years, which is mainly targeted, and you can see it on the right-hand side, uh, for high-end personal computers, the typical um, end-user devices that are residing on a desktop or on a server. And then we have a new implementation, which is a re-implementation of the, the runtime in NCC, in pure NCC, which is ranging from the industrial PC down to the PLC, the uh, programmable logical, logic controller. And in the middle, you have all various other type of devices, which is addressed by the CodeMeter embedded runtime. And then we have even a much smaller implementation, which is called CodeMeter Micro Embedded, which ranges from the microcontroller level down to the field program of gate array. And um, the requirements, and this is what I would like to show on the next slide, is the same and the same technology. The only difference is the type of implementation. The difference in the implementation type is um, basically guided by the requirements. So the full-blown CodeMeter runtime doesn't have any constraints in terms of hardware. The CodeMeter embedded driver, however, is also taking care of the fact that in the embedded system space, uh, devices are typically less powerful in terms of CPU powerness or powerfulness and uh, memory limitations. So typically, uh, embedded devices do lack in memory and also storage space as well as computing power. And even smaller devices like microcontrollers, they have even less uh, resources. So the typical uh, microcontroller we support with the CodeMeter micro embedded driver is the Infineon XMC 4500, which is also an ARM-based device, but it only has one megabyte of flash, including flash for the application that needs to run on it. Uh, on, a, on the next slide, um, you see the three different flavors that I just explained, and it shows the difference between the different functionalities. So, as I said, there are trade-offs for the CodeMeter embedded driver. It doesn't support everything that is available on the CodeMeter full-blown runtime, but it is a very powerful subset of it, and it basically driven by the requirements of our customers, what they need for the embedded devices. And it's the same for the micro embedded implementation. It even has less functionality, but it's suited for the requirement for a microcontroller. So uh, by this, I would like to give you an overview of the implementation of the CodeMeter embedded driver. So it is an alternative for a CodeMeter runtime in the case where, for example, you might have an operating system that is currently not supported by a runtime, or you might even have a proprietary OS that you created yourself, but you need to have the functionality of CodeMeter. This is an alternative offering for the CodeMeter runtime by using the same technology, but in a different implementation. So the implementation allows you to have direct access to either a CM dongle or a CM act license, it is implemented as a C runtime library, which is very portable, and it's even available at source code level. So the structure is modular, so you can decide which module you need in your implementation, which also uh, resides, uh, results in the fact that you might have different sizes of the library. So it can range from 90 kilobytes, so if you really include only what you need in terms of, let's say, a CMX implementation, or you could also include all the different modules, then you will end up in having a size of about 300 kilobytes. 
it is a compatible subset of the API that is offered. So it's the identical API, but it's a, a smaller subset, given by the fact that the resources are tied on an embedded device. This is the decision to have only a subset for that. And the main purpose of the existence of the library is to run it on an embedded operating system. So by this, uh, John, can you explain a little bit about the architecture? Certainly. The architecture is fairly simple in the, uh, for embedded. Uh, and it's, it's got some similarities with the uh, kind of code meter deployments that we have for the other systems. And here we see we have CM dongle, which uh, continues with file I.O. And, and HID communications, though we have on the ASIC level, I believe, the SPI communications. Uh, C, uh, Code Meter Act license, of course, uh, continues uh, with various kinds of binding scheme or custom binding, uh, like as we see here in the slide, and a, a potential for binding to a TPM. Uh, runtime Bridge is uh, allowing us to use the embedded drivers alongside the an installed code meter runtime for testing. And this way, we don't have any kind of strange behavior when testing our uh, embedded modules. And of course, uh, continuing with the ability to have network licenses, CMWAN is also part of the code meter embedded communications options. So um, going back to Gunther here, we're going to go uh, continue with more of the embedded core and in the details of the modules. Well, thanks, John. Um, as John already mentioned, you have those different modules that are basically configurable. So the overall picture is demonstrated on the right-hand side. And then we have all these different components listed on the left-hand side. And I would like to dive into more details on those on the left-hand side that are listed. So in, in the center of everything, there is this core functionality. And the core functionality is basically the crypto libraries, the symmetric and asymmetric encryption, a secure hash, and all those things you need to have for the cryptographic parts. But on the other side, it's also all the management functionality that is necessary to organize the handles, to get access to the API, so the memory management internally, basically, in the code meter embedded implementation. And all the other necessary basic functions like the POSIX layer, which I'm not going to explain in too much detail, but it would allow you to basically adapt and um, port the, the library to any type of operating system that might not have a POSIX implementation underneath. It is just a, a layer of abstraction. On the side of the new implementation of the new product that we just brought onto the market, the version 2.0, there is an extension to the uh, past existing core implementation, which is a very important one. It's the license cache. The license cache is basically pre-caching the information out of the CM code meter container and allows faster access to this. And this has been implemented to implement another feature that is new in, in 2.0, which is multiple application access, which you will see on the next slide. So the multiple application access is uh, improving the functionality of the code meter embedded driver. In the current version, in the 1.7 version, you are limited with one application to have access to the dongle or the ACT license. And the combination of the license cache and this multiple application access allows you to have multiple processes uh, accessing the same dongle and the same ACT container at the same time. So the library is serializing this and it's communicating through a shared memory model between the different processes. One implementation that makes use of it is the OPC UA reference implementation that we work with with a company called Ascolab. And this implementation uses the code meter storage area to store the, the private key for, for example, certificates in a secure place. In addition, you also have the typical dongle support. And as John already mentioned, the new thing 
in the 2.0 implementation is the SPI support, so the serial peripheral bus or interface. So this allows you to have cheaper and um, lower bomb costs on a development of an embedded motherboard. So some of the devices out there in the field do not want to have a second USB controller just to address uh, the ASIC, so that's the underlying secure uh, smart card element that is part of CodeMeter. And then and you still have the older ways to access the code meter environment through either file I.O. on a mass storage device or if the requirement of a company asks for that through a human interface device so the device doesn't show up as a mass storage device in your environment. Uh, in addition to that, you also have the same possibility as on a, on a big runtime side, so on a desktop runtime side, you can build uh, up an ACT license, but there is a, a huge difference between the one on the desktop. In the desktop space, you get this uh, advantage that we at Rebu take care of the binding, so we have a mechanism that's called smart bind, and that's not applic applicable to the embedded space because all of the devices are different. So you need to implement a specific own implementation of the fingerprint to basically bind the license against the device and there is also a mechanism to control the dynamic data that is stored there uh, through a secure counter and the activation mechanism for the ACT license itself is exactly the same as on the, the runtime. So John, can you give a, a practical example of what people use to do the binding nowadays? Yeah, sure. Uh, the interesting thing about the embedded world in IoT or these kinds of devices is whereas on the major operating systems or, or the more common major platforms, the PC comes to mind, of course, uh, we can pretty much go with smart bind and uh, pretty much forget about binding at that point. But with embedded, we're closer to the hardware and because of that, there's limitations. Uh, the chipset may have limitations or as for example with raspberries uh, don't keep time very well. So we have to specify in this case or in these cases of binding with CodeMeter Act which parts as we can see here in this view that we want to comprise the fingerprint, and you see a nice fingerprint symbol over there, of the license itself. So with that, if any of this changes the container uh, breaks, as we say in the vernacular. And we get some opportunities then to explore extra devices. We see here the Intel SGX and the TPM are also uh, listed here where uh, we have to take some extra steps to uh, make our license more specific to the device and make it unclonable. Um, with the CMLAN, I think things also uh, get a little bit uh, easier. Uh, we have still the concurrent licenses. Uh, this concurrent licensing is often considered the seats of a network license. Like how many times we have uh, the option where we would have, say, one activation or, in the case of dongles, just send one dongle for more than one user or more than one device in the network. Uh, that saves money as well, and it saves us hardware, less uh, activations to contend with, or less uh, dongles to send. And of course, uh, CMLAN makes the devices, regardless of what kind they are, code meter embedded, or some of the more mainline systems, can all use the same licenses. It doesn't matter if the license is on a Macintosh or Windows or Linux server, and it doesn't matter if the client endpoint using the license is a Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone Black or even a micro-embedded system. <clears throat> I'm going to take it back to you uh, to cover some of the uh, runtime bridge, which is a very interesting approach. And then there is a specific implementation that is not available on the uh, CodeMeter runtime and a big one, which is specific to the embedded driver. Um, the so-called CodeMeter runtime bridge, and John already mentioned it in the architecture slide. This is there to be able to have a, a smooth way to develop your application. 
So you can have a coexistence of the big one, the big runtime, and the embedded driver on the same device. In this case, it's very similar to the LAN implementation. The communication is done between the embedded driver and the desktop runtime, but in this case not over LAN, it's uh, over a shared memory model. And this is just to avoid the interference between the two implementations talking to the same dongle. In this case, if you wouldn't do that, the dongle would just see this as an attack and would lock itself. And to avoid this, you have this additional module which is called runtime bridge. So this is allowing you to have the same um, implementation, one which is probably based on the embedded driver and the other one on the code meter runtime, which you might need to, for example, demonstration or testing or development environments to create licenses, which makes it much easier to do it on one machine. And John can give you an overview now about all the different secure elements we have. Okay, thanks Gunther. So here we can talk about a little bit about the API. Uh, as is uh, typical with any code meter deployment, code meter embedded also gives us uh, opportunity to run authentication routines, encryption. There's also error management and license management. Uh, license management would be all about the marshalling of context file data update and activation data for typically with Code Meter Act. Of course, it's also with dongles. We may even see a little bit of that today. Um, the, uh, there's almost uh, a one-on-one. -on -one. In fact, I think there is, except for the difference in the header files for the source code, between the code that we can use to comprise a desktop system using the Code Meter API and the Code Meter embedded system. We can practically just cut and paste uh, and save, save ourselves a lot of time. Uh, you don't have to write out new code. We can copy our files over as we need to. I have personally on many occasions tested, uh, used the Code Meter API guide on a Windows desktop using the GUI to create my source code and then use a FileZilla or WinSCP over to a Raspberry Pi, switch over to the proper header file, and compile it with GCC over there, and it would work straight out. So here we, of course, have many form factors. Um, there are some that I still even haven't seen personally yet myself, and I'm just down the hall from a whole room full of these things. Uh, we have just about any form factor to fit any situation. And uh, of course, our most popular is the dongle, but we can see here that we can go all the way down to an ASIC. And when we say ASIC, we're talking about a chip. And on the chip level, with chips, you can have what we call an SOHC 8, SOHC uh, 4s. Uh, if you look over just uh, from the utmost left, about the third, fourth in there, um, it comes down to just a chip with little pins. So whatever your needs are, we can meet those needs with form factors there. So if you have systems that don't have USB ports or, or slots, all is not necessarily lost. And with SPI, if you don't have USB drivers, we can still accommodate that. Of course, typically the dongles are supported and embedded, as mentioned. Uh, sticks, of course, we have many tests here going on with that. Uh, but of particular interest here is the ASIC and the SPI bus communication. I think this is probably the most interesting part of this slide. <clears throat> now typically, and I've seen this myself, uh, I work mostly with the what we loosely call it DLL. Uh, of course, that's a dynamic link library, but with CM embedded, they mostly tend to be like an, a Linux type of image, so we're dealing then with .so files. So when you test on a Raspberry or BeagleBone, you'll be dealing with linking dynamically the .so file. However, the software that you would send out into the wild is going to be statically linked. 
Uh, the reason being is that it can be more secure and faster. And of course, the embedded world can be a little bit unpredictable, or you're going to have a lib subfolder somewhere. Things can change dramatically. Um, and if, and if, if we can't provide you with the right library, we can also provide you with the source so you can compile and link your own. And that's where things can get really fun. And as you can see on the bottom of this slide, an NDA is necessary because you're actually getting the source code to CodeMeter. All right, so Gunther, um, you're the expert here with CM Embedded, so I'm going to leave the integration to you. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, I, I think the, the best thing, first of all, is to understand the different mechanisms that are behind this integration. So nobody likes to work with cryptography. So basically, what the tool set that we provide is uh, trying to avoid is that you have to deal with the cryptography part yourself. So underneath, the tools will also use cryptography, but you don't really use it directly. So we support symmetric encryption with a 128-bit AES algorithm. And then for asymmetric encryption, we basically support 224-bit ECC, which is our preferred way to do it. But we also have a possibility to have up to 2048-bit RSA uh, asynchronous uh, asymmetric uh, encryption which is typically used for signatures or authentication, uh, especially against remote servers. So, um, yeah. And um, just to give you the overall picture, we have multiple ways to achieve this. First of all, you would like to avoid to go into the cryptographic part. This allows you uh, the so-called automatic encryption and the automatic encryption is based on the AX protector. And we have one product which is available in a suite, which is the code meter protection suite. And the specific part that we are talking about in this case right now is the code meter embedded version of the AX protector and a specific implementation that is there for the embedded environment, which is called EX protector. And you will see more of that later on. If this is not enough for you, you have always the possibility to use the core meter code API, uh, core API and use encryption yourself. So you have all the algorithms underneath available in the library. And you can also build your own license queries for instance in your software, as well as do an automatic activation and deactivation in your software through using the, the core API. And John, can you give us an Big picture overview of all different implementations in the protection suite? Certainly. This is one of my favorite topics because with protection suite, I like to, it is actually very easy for me uh, to do all the development in one place. I could be a little lazy when it comes to this stuff. So we can, uh, I can bring my software to Windows and uh, even develop on there using tool chains. Now, those of you who are developers in the audience, you know all about the tool chains. So you can also compile and link your programs there as well. And then, of course, me, I like to um, I like to uh, to do all the code testing on Windows and then bring that over. So uh, Axe Protector gives us uh, the the ability to uh, create the encrypted version that we just copy over and it's ready to go for the platform. There's some special commands we have to use with Axe Protector, it's, uh, but it's not too complex. It's really nothing to worry about there. So we get all of the same uh, capabilities with Embedded that we have with the software that we might encrypt for one of the more mainline systems, anti-debug, protection of resources, and things of that nature. Let's move on to the next. Let's see, we're going to. So we're already talking to a great extent about Axe Protector. We're going to see Axe Protector for code meter embedded. Um, I'm going to go ahead because this also is going to uh, take us into some rather um, extraordinary territory here. 
I'm going to give this one back to Gunther to show us because I believe he has a very interesting demo that when I saw this earlier this week, it was, I was very amazed. So it's all yours. So. so thanks again. So um, as, I, as I said already before, so it's about the automatic encryption. So you, you basically take your regular application without any modification and or libraries. So you could also encrypt libraries. And the main purpose is you want to protect your IP against reverse engineering. But you do not want to spend a lot of time doing it yourself. You just want to make this task easy and, and smooth. And therefore, we use the 128-bit AES implementation in the library to achieve this. So the first approach is the AX protector, which you might already know from the desktop. It's basically the same implementation. It is just a different license you need to use the functionality in the AX protector. So what the AX protector on the desktop does is visualized on this slide. So you have your typical application which comes out of the linker after you linked all your different binaries that have been compiled before. And then you have the typical structure like you have code sections, data sections, resources in the file. And all of this is depending on the platform that you're using. Either you use Windows and use Windows PE or COF, or you use an alpha format, for example, typically on Unix or different Unix flavors. And then you pump the code through the AX protector, and the AX protector is creating a new structure. It keeps the header file, so everything looks the same from the outside. It completely encrypts the code, and it also encrypts the data sections as well as the resources. In addition to it does the encryption, it also injects an engine, which is called AX Engine, which does the reverse thing. It's doing the decryption at runtime. It's basically a self-extracting executable, which will be loaded, and the AX Engine will do the reverse thing. So it will, depending on the license, if there is a license available with the right keys in the storage, in the, in the code meter storage, do its matching and do the reverse engineering, except um, in a reverse uh, thing it will do the decryption. And CodeMeter Embedded, the version for CodeMeter Embedded, is doing the exact same thing, except that it doesn't use the underlying CodeMeter runtime. It brings its own library with it, so the CodeMeter Embedded library. And the CodeMeter Embedded library is, in, is used instead of the regular desktop runtime. Other than that, it's the complete same thing. And I just would like to give you an example of how this would look like. So I have prepared um, a very simple example, uh, which is based on the, um, in this case, example that I use for a very simple program. And it's just here. Uh, therefore, I use an X-terminal client, or a server in this case, on, on my Windows system to visualize this, and I'm connected with this to my Raspberry Pi. So I use a Raspberry Pi for demonstration purposes. It could be another device as well, but typically it's this sort of devices that is uh, going to be an embedded device in the market. So I have a very small application which is um, trying to figure out if there is um, a license available, or if the application is encrypted and it, if it can be shipped. So in this case, I just check if the application is encrypted. So as you can see, the application is in its original form, so the unprotected binary. And it just tells me, OK, I checked if there is a, a license for me, if I'm encrypted. And it tells me, no, I'm not encrypted. And <clears throat> If I want to go uh, on the next step on this, I have to start up AX Protector and copy over this Whoopi sample, which is an ELF binary in this case, because it's running on a, on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, and I would like to show you how this would look like on a, a implementation when I run the AX Protector on a Windows environment. So I copied over. Just to save time, I already prepared this. Copy over the Whoopi sample to my Windows desktop where I run the AX protector. And it's the same thing uh, if you use it on a regular native binary on Windows 
as if you do it on this ELF binary that is coming from the ARM system that I'm currently using to demonstrate this. I go through the typical dialog system, same thing as on a big Windows or big Linux uh, x86 environment, and I get the exact same options. And in the security area, as John already mentioned, you also get basic debugger check and virtual machine detection, um, license activation check, and so on. And you can even have your own message handler in this place. It's exactly the same as on a desktop. The magic comes here in the advanced options. So you specify with the minus X C switch and the target system, which target you are going to, to use and that you want to use the embedded library instead of the regular runtime. And it is important to specify the target system because all the different ARM implementations have two flavors typically. One is the HF, which is the hard float, which is a, a floating point implementation in hardware, or a software implementation of the floating point. And it's important because you need to have the right library. And the, the recipe that I'm currently using is implemented as a hard float implementation on a Linux side. So on the next step, I get all these details that I need to do the uh, automatic encryption, and then I press finish, and then our AX protector is basically just encrypting the ELF binary, and you will see afterwards that you, it identified it as an ELF file, so you can see it here. It's an ELF file running on Linux, and I just have to copy over the encrypted version now to my Linux system, and I'm done. So as you can see, it's the exact same way how to use it as on a regular desktop system. And to show you um, how this would look like with the API that I use, if I have an encrypted version or a non-encrypted version, I already copied it to the protected directory, which is the same application as you have seen before. And in this case, it will tell me, hey, I'm encrypted. So this is the one I'm going to ship, and the other one I might use for internal testing. In addition to the AX protector, we already mentioned that there is this implementation called EX protector. EX protector is a derivative of the AX protector, and you will see the difference very soon. So AX protector is there for specific implementations where you have access to the OS code, so where you can modify the operating system loader. So current implementations currently using this as the VxWorks implementation from Wind River, the 3S Codices implementation, different embedded Linux versions, and also Android. So you achieve the exact same thing as with the AX protector, but you have a different approach by doing this. So the AX protector, uh, the EX protector is also taking the unencrypted binary as it comes from uh, the compiler and linker, and then it's com completely encrypting the application. But it doesn't inject any uh, decryption engines or the EX engine into the binary. It's just adding things like a, a signature, a binary signature for the, a digital signature for the, for the binary, and also certificates to build up a certificate chain. Uh, the other side that is decrypting uh, the binary at the end and checking the, uh, the integrity of the binary is basically moved to the loader of the OS, which allows you to have this code only once in the OS, and you do not have to replicate it in all the different binaries. So the integration in the, US look, uh, in the OS looks like this in the operating system. So the operating system loader would be modified, and it would contain the so-called EX engine. The EX engine, on the other side, could also have a certificate that it is storing and is checking against binaries that are loaded into the US if the binary has been modified or tampered with. And an additional option, but you don't have to do that, could be also that you might have encrypted a binary, but you could also only do the integrity check. There are additional steps possible but that's something they can do very easily as soon as you have access to the OS. So uh, in the next slide, you see an extended version of this, which is called a secure boot mechanism. The secure boot mechanism is implemented in VxWorks 6 and 7. So the loader 
any operating system. Uh, uh, so at, at the loader, so the firmware loader, which is basically the one residing in firmware on the hardware side, has a certificate in the TPM module, which is typically in this case a x86 system, which has a preloaded certificate. Then you have a preloader, which is a modified bootloader, which is coming from Wind River in this case, who has an implementation of the EX engine in it. And then the verification of the bootloader, which is basically a signed version of the bootloader against the certificate information in, in, uh, in the certificate that is residing in the TPM module, is verifying the consistency and that the binary has not been modified. And then if this is okay, the next step happens, which is exactly the same thing as you have seen before. The operating system loader, which is modified, also has the EX engine in it is able to do this verification again, and optionally, if the binary, in this case the OS itself, would be encrypted, there would be a decryption going on at the same time, and then at the end, the application that needs to be started would have to have the same thing, the verification would happen, and so on, and if everything is okay, and the chain is not broken, the application would start. If somebody modified something in between, the behavior would be the system would stop loading, and you would be informed that somebody tampered with the system. So this is how the implementation looks like in a specific one, which is available in the Wixworks version. But you could also do this in other operating systems. But there is a small challenge, typically. Like in the previous slide, there is a difference because the TPM module contains a certificate that comes from companies like Microsoft and so on. And if you would replace this, you would not be able to run Windows on the system anymore. To avoid this, people came up with ideas like having a sort of another bootloader, and one of it is called, in the Linux space, gummy boat that allows you to load things afterwards. So what you do is you sign this bootloader, in this case, especially Windows, or Microsoft is signing the bootloader. It gives you the possibility to sign it. If it's the correct version, you load the bootloader. And at this stage, you can start to do the same thing, but on your own, um, putting your own certificates in the TPM, and then the whole thing is repeating as you have seen it before. So we, now we, we reach the point where John can give us more details on the implementation that is available of the API set on the embedded side. OK, thank you very much, Gunther. That was uh, some cutting edge stuff. And after all that, that great uh, complex stuff. Let's have uh, a little break with the nice and uh, easy concept of the core API. And the core API for embedded, as we have said, it's a subset of the main API with the difference only in the header files. And if you're familiar with the core API of CodeMeter, you can see here that the uh, our more popular function calls are available. And they're pretty much this, uh, exactly used as just as they are for the other systems. The uh, core API, uh, if you might be thinking, what what can we use it for? In case you're, if you're already using it on the Windows system, uh, typically, like the cmcrypt2 call, might be used to encrypt your data streams or files. Uh, cmcrypt2 handles arrays of bytes. So whatever your data is, if you can get it into an array of bytes, you can encrypt it. And then you can put it into any medium you want. So whether it's going to go out into a file or to, say, an HTTP post or get, uh, we can pretty much handle that. Secure data exchange, as you've seen in the previous slide with the authentication routines, it's possible to uh, with signatures and signing to see. Uh, you can check with a device, for example, with authentication if it's, uh, make sure that somebody hasn't just swapped it out, which is probably one of the main concerns of IoT. Uh, these devices can be so small that uh, they they can fit in a little mint tin. Uh, you sneak one into a data center, but also the uh, asymmetric encryption, which uh, the routines derive from the authentication, can be used to move a short session key 
which would then be used for the other AES routines for some back and forth communication. Uh, <clears throat> further on asymmetric encryption, of course, there could be a logon process involved so that uh, systems or some of these IoT devices, if we're, if we're worried particularly about the security and people sneaking out devices in there, uh, we're seeing a lot more of these small devices with Bluetooth uh, and wireless capabilities. I believe the uh, Raspberry Pi Zero is uh, going to have a new model that is capable of uh, wireless or Bluetooth. So you know, somebody can always throw one in there. So we definitely want to challenge these devices that pop up in the network and code meter, the core API of code meter can help us with these uh, with these extra checks and just make sure that these devices are who they say they are. So here, um, as I had mentioned before, this is code that is generally the same um, from a mainline code meter runtime installation or where we would use a core API on a run on a mainline runtime and the embedded except for that .h file. And I know that uh, Gunther has a little bit more on that as he's, he's got the Raspberry on hand for it. So Gunther, well, I saw you do this before. Yeah, so I prepared another small demo. In this case, I use WinSCP to get back to my recipe. And I have a small program, which is a little bit different from what the one that is shown on the slide. The one on the slide is just checking if there is a license, but in this case, I have a small application that is doing encryption. So this is the code that is currently running on the Raspberry Pi. I can show that to you. Uh, also through my X terminal. Uh, I would like to just start it. It is doing a simple encryption and decryption. And um, I would like to take the same code, port it over, uh, bring it over. To, to the Windows environment and use it on a big runtime. So you can see that the API is exactly the same. So um, in this case, I just want to bring up again another X terminal, which is another terminal to my Raspberry Pi. And I would like to start this AES program, which is doing a simple encryption and decryption through uh, a key that is, in this case, uh, firm code 10, prior code 13, and you can see the data coming in, it's decrypted, coming out. So that's basically, the, in this case, using the code matter embedded runtime. So this is the code for it, and I also prepared an empty project on Visual Studio, and wanted to use, uh, and I want to use the code that is here to a copy of all the code and just copy it bring it over to my Visual Studio project, which is here, copy it into my empty C code, which is not existing before, which is just it. And I have one problem in this case, you see all this red, line in, red lines in my code, which is all related to the fact that I have a, a different header file here, because I need to have the code meter big runtime, the major mainline runtime, and what I do here is I just remove this compact and then I have ported the application. So that's what you wouldn't do in a real life scenario. You would have an if that there. But just to demonstrate how easy it is to do that, and I just use a compile and compile it and you see it's the same code base. So as I said, you wouldn't do it this way, but it's the easier way to demonstrate it. So by this, we can go on on the slides. Okay, thanks, Gunther. Actually, that is the way I do it because you know, what we saw, what we just saw right there, was as much typing as I like to do, and no more. So, this is where Code Meter Embedded is uh, supported. These are the platforms. Um, but as I mentioned before, if we get really off the map for you uh, with an NDA and some source code, we may be able to accommodate you. Um, just a cursory glance at this slide. Um, the major systems, and of course we have some embedded Linux, which would cover various uh, 
Gunther has a Raspberry Pi at his side, and I have a BeagleBone Black at my side, where, where I also do some code meter work uh, in combination with other things. Let's look at some protection suites and see where that's available. Uh, the slides are practically the same, actually, or they look so much alike, I should be like, did they even switch it? <clears throat> So here's a protection suite, and this is pretty much, uh, I won't get into too much detail here, but this tells you where our tools will work uh, and for what system. Uh, of course, we always have more information on that as available. Um, we've been dealing mostly with APIs and uh, encryption and such, but those actions in CodeMeter do not create licenses, so we won't spend a whole lot of time on this, but let's go ahead and we'll just show some license creation here. We have the, uh, one of the options we have, if you really like to customize your license creation, uh, we have uh, the, the high-level programming API. Of course, the derived from the API is CMBox program, which is a command line tool commonly seen in a DOS box or at a Linux terminal or a Macintosh terminal. Uh, the Code Meter License Editor, which uh, at present does not support Code Meter Act or the Universal Firm Code, I might add. I get asked this almost every day, so no. Um, are probably one of our uh, better tools for all around programming is License Central. It's extremely scalable and flexible. It has various uh, means to communicate with it. And of course, as we can see, we have here a couple of arrows coming out of own application, and this is where you would actually be dealing with the high-level programming API itself, like the License Central and CMBox program, the License Editor use the programming API, but with every code meter SDK installation, you also have the ability to take on the uh, libraries and includes and such for the programming API. Of course, we have C++, .NET, uh, and so you, you want to write your own application. However, own application also can communicate with License Central through WSDL services, gateways, and connectors. And that brings us to this slide where we have our License Central. We have uh, a depot, we can see, and the License Central is an entirely self-contained system with its own database. And between the vendor and the end user, we'll see where we have some, for example, uh, the vendor is in charge of the order, and it's coming from the ERP section, ERP e-commerce. It's possible to connect License Central with, say, an online shopping cart type of arrangement or an account payable as a front end uh, through, uh, the, we got the connector, which uses an HTTP or HTTPS basis, or we also have the SOAP WSDL services, which on a hosted License Central, can be offered on an encrypted HTTPS channel. The action of creating an order creates a ticket, and this ticket is something that the end user or customer is going to use. You see here the ticket goes to the end user, and the end user is going to make use of a license portal, or we also call that a front end for License Central. We can see here that would be, say, for example, the License Central depot. Um, and the, the depot can be on the LC itself or as a separate front-end server. This action of going to the depot with a, uh, the ticket, which looks uh, amazingly like an activation code, as you might have seen with other software, uh, there's a, a chance for an interaction between the end user system and this depot for the activation and or later update of the license, which we see on that fifth element right here. So I believe that if we look at the next slide, we see here that the depot and the gateway is mentioned here. That um, This is where I've been referring to from the previous slide. And these are ways of front-ending License Central or communicating with it. So you can have an LC in your network with your own database and ERP system handling the order creation. And you can also have the systems in, say, your DMZ 
that deal with the end users whose systems will come into it. Of course, if for dealing with embedded systems and possibly IoT, the entire thing can operate in one network, and it's just a matter of your routers at that point. So uh, I believe Gunther has something to show us for that, and this really amazed me a couple of days ago when I saw it, because even I didn't know it was possible up until that time. So Gunther, show us how uh, we would do this with a Raspberry. Okay, thanks, John. So what I would like to do is to demonstrate how to use the, the web depot for an offline activation. So that's typically very common in this embedded space because most of the devices are not really online connected. So it's an important thing to be able to do that. And the other thing is afterwards I would like to show if you are lucky and you are connected to the online world, you can do this in a much easier way. But first of all, I would like to start with the uh, offline activation using the web depot. So this is another way to look at my recipe. It's a, it's a, a, a browser called NetSurf that I use here. And I connect to my web depot, which is running on an Apache server, and then it's the Apache server on the other side is connected to my uh, license central. And I have a ticket prepared that I'm going to use, uh, which is basically, as John said before, the license that I uh, had. And um, I just copy it over, the license, through my ticket, so which is done through a copy-paste because it would take too long to type it in. So this is my ticket that I prepared and I'm going to uh, use this ticket to pick up my license from my Raspberry Pi. So uh, in this case I have a very simple application which has a base license and uh, different uh, yeah, interconnection modules like a Modbus or Ethernet license, or Ethercat license, and I would like to activate this on my Raspberry Pi. I'm lucky I'm using the same Pi, but it could be another device, so I could have copied all those things that you see on another uh, PC through a mass storage device and transported it from one device to another, but in this case it's much simpler. I can use my recipe for that. I would like to collect those licenses, and I have no runtime, so that means I have to do it offline in this case, because on my recipe there is no runtime available, it's only my embedded driver. So I choose the offline activation. In this case I still have the choice to select which license I would like to have and then I have to create my context file. So the context file is basically the content of my current uh, license container and now I have to go back to my recipe and create this context file. And this is done in this case for a command line environment and it's the same terminal you have seen before but in this case I have my very simple activation mechanism and I have a program that is using the license which is a, a very simple application and as you can see the base license is already here and the other licenses are missing. So the first thing I do is I create my uh, license activation file so the context file and then I can pick it up from my browser that you have seen before and select the just reasonably created uh, context file which is this one so I just created it and upload it to the license center so which is happening in the next step and now the license center got my context file and I would like to receive my update file as uh, John has just demonstrated in the, in the graphic. So I would like to request my um, um, update file in this case. So And I'm going to store it in the same directory where I just got the context file, download the context file, uh, the update file in this case, and you will see I just received my update file and I'm going to import this update file, in this case I just use a shell script I already prepared, into my license and uh, in my license container and I have the license available now, which is in this case again my simple program and you, you saw that I added another base license 
uh, and two, two modules. And you will see the two modules that I just uploaded uh, with my license are available in my application now. So to fulfill this in a real uh, complete way, I also decided to really confirm that I received the license and I sent up a so-called um, receipt. And this is just another RAC file, if you want, which is just confirming the content in my container is now complete. So I actually downloaded the license and I also installed it. So it's not only just downloaded, I confirm that I installed it. And I'm going to select my receipt now, which I just created. And at this stage, the license center knows that I really installed the license and everything is fine. So this is the hard way to do it if you go with um, an offline activation because you have no other choice to do that. But there is an easier one, which I also would like to demonstrate. You can also use the gateways that have been already mentioned to talk to the license center in a programmatic way, which is basically what we do in the next demonstration. It's just the same thing except that we, in this case, do not use an offline activation. Everything is done online and it's done in a polling way. So we basically are in a loop and we check if the license has changed or not. And I would like to show you uh, <clears throat> uh, how the program is started. So I have a, a serial number of the dongle that I'm using. I'm also specifying the IP address to my gateway and I also give the ticket which you have seen before and I specify which frame code I do and the loop every three seconds my small application is basically checking for the availability of a new license on this ticket which is basically visualized here so the yellow thing is just checking the gateway and it's getting a gateway it's sending out a gateway response uh, request and getting a response back in this case, it just recognizes Ticket has four new licenses for me, which they will pick up in my program. Then you get the four licenses. The four licenses are going to be installed in my dongle. And then I see, in this case, it's 2001, 2004, the four different licenses that I picked up. And we use some of the product item options that have been mentioned in the very beginning. In this case, we have a paper use model, which is a unit counter, which is always decremented by running the program again and again and again, because it's using a function which is decrypting, uh, which is using an encrypt function, and therefore reducing the license counter every time. Then we have a license which is very simple, and another license which is basically a, a time-based license, which has an expiration time. And all of this is done automatically. And if I would change the ticket content, it would pick up the new license information automatically and would put it into my device. So this is the other way how you can address this. And therefore, since we are in the time constraint, I would like to move forward. This was the gateway software activation wizard, if you want to look at it like this, which was the online way to do the activation. By this, uh, I would like to hand over again to John. Okay, I'm only going to talk briefly about this because we're going to be wrapping this up soon, but we do have a question to answer. Um, so I'd just like to point out that was uh, some good stuff there with the gateway communication. I am going to be begging for the source code for that later. Um, <clears throat> so just a note here. Uh, the License Central Web Depot is fully customizable, so if you're looking at this and thinking, well, I don't want to use that, that's uh, their logos and such, no problem. It uses uh, basically CSS uh, style sheets and such, and it's very easy to modify, so there's no worries there. So I think we're just about ready to wrap this up here. Um, let's look at the summary. Uh, let's see. Okay, yes, multi-vendor. We're pretty much everywhere. Uh, embedded, portable, modular, and ZC. I believe we've proven that, right, Gunther? Uh, so. Yeah, I hope so. I hope we've proved that by now. If, if we can't convince you at this point, I think we're in a little trouble. Uh, same API for code meter standard and embedded. That's one of my favorites. Same tool set. 
And as we saw, especially with License Central, the same license management system. Um, looking at the question, we do have one question. I'm going to ask it. Maybe Gunther has a response for this. Um, are there any experiences in the field with the code meter embedded technology? Uh, I believe that uh, maybe some success stories might do. Yeah, we, 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 have, we have a very recent success story with a company called Stefan. Um, they are building devices that are used in emergency situations. And um, they have had a platform which is not supported out of the box. They had to port the library to make this happen. And if you are interested in more details, you can download the case study, which is about a company called Stefan. And they basically have a aspiration uh, device that is used in emergency rooms. And it came up with a new licensing model to uh, re re reduce the entry price of the device uh, because it's a very uh, tough market and the price is very price sensitive. And um, this is another example of where people just use a bare metal implementation. So the hardware is an Atmo platform. And they basically use a combination. So they use a SD card version. And they boot out of the SD card, which also contains the code meter um, dongle. And they do all the license checking and, and also booting of the device from this SD card. And they did the port of also the uh, embedded library. And they use the library in this environment. Okay. All right, Gunther. Another question has come in. Uh, the question is, is there a possibility to get an evaluation kit of the code meter embedded API? I believe that's an easy one. Yes, that's pretty simple. So on the Vibu website, you can go and do a developer download. In the developer download section, there is a, a download that's called uh, embedded uh, demo kit. It contains um, it contains all the details in a, in a, in a DLL or SE form for uh, development uh, and getting started for standard um, Linux and, and Windows environments. So it's just easy. You can just download it from there. And in, if you need more, you can always send a mail to sales at reboot.com and then somebody will follow up with you and give you more details. Okay, yes. Um, for inquiries, of course, there's always, uh, you can inquire at sales at weboo.com and we will get somebody to help you on that. But if So, let's see. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. Uh, we appreciate it. Yeah, thanks also from my side. And I think Daniela still has something to tell us, right? Yes. Thank you, Gunther, and thank you, John, for this very interesting conversation, and a special thanks to all our attendees for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this masterclass as much as we did. Remember to answer the short quiz as soon as we close the session for your chance to win an Amazon coupon worth 50 euro. Our next email with a link to the recording and the slide deck will be with you in a couple of days. That's all, folks, for today. See you next month for a new engaging topic. Have a bright day.